When you brush with new tooth tunes. Long last, the sequel to the sandiest film ever made has finally been released. And holy shit, the hype has been insane. I've been a fan of Denis Villeneuve's work since Arrival. It's easily in my top five, maybe even top three favorite movies of all time. And of course, we can't leave out Blade Runner 2049, which made him a directorial darling for many, many science fiction fans, including myself. He's such an incredible director, and it seems like every movie he makes and every movie he touches is gold. He's been my favorite director for quite a while now, so I am so happy to see one of his movies finally get the love it deserves. Now while Dune Part 1 did very well, especially considering the COVID restrictions and the fact that it was on HBO, a lot of his movies are notorious for being critical darlings but absolutely failing in the box office, so to say that this is so exciting to talk about is an understatement. Now I need to put out a disclaimer, I have not read Dune, I know quite a bit about the lore from the countless and countless uh, video essays on YouTube that I delved into before I watched the first one. And I know a lot of people are super split on this, but I have to come out and admit it that the original 1984 Dune, or I think 83, I can't remember, the original Dune movie by David Lynch is a guilty pleasure of mine. It's not a perfect movie by any means, but if you like science fiction from the 80s and you like the practical effects of like Star Wars and Blade Runner and, you know, Robocop and things of, you know, of that era, it really just scratches that itch of like weird, creepy science fiction, practical effects. Um, and I definitely think that it's still worth a watch, even with all its flaws. Kill this child, she's an abomination. Kill her. Get out of my mind! So going into that first film, I felt pretty primed and prepped and ready to watch it. And when I finally did watch it, I was blown away. I mean, the spectacle is incredible. Uh, if you watch an IMAX, you have that super tall ratio. So you really get to soak in all that beautiful imagery that Denis and his cinematographer, Greg Fraser, uh, put onto that screen. And I know a lot of people think that the story is confusing because of all the different factions and stuff, but I'm a Mobile Suit Gundam fan, all right? I was a Game of Thrones fan, okay? So I, you know, it's, I'm a little biased. It's a little easier for me to, to pick up this, these kind of like political fantasy stories. But I think that regardless of that fact, Denis did an excellent job of cutting out just the right amount of information to, to give you what you need without overwhelming you. And even though I loved a lot of the movie and it did blow me away, I was somewhat disappointed by not only the fact that it was a part one, but because of where it ended. The ending to me was a little anticlimactic. Uh, while it was nice to have like an intimate scene just between two characters fighting, compared to everything that came before it, it just felt like a tonal whiplash, especially for the end of the movie. And I, I have a pet peeve, okay? <laughs> Whenever in a movie or in a show or when, when someone just goes, this is the beginning. I just, I hate it. I hate it. It's so cheesy. It's so awful. So when Zendaya turns around and looks at Paul and says, this is only the beginning. And then the credits start rolling. I was like, oh, come on. But other than a few, a few uh, character moments, I, I really love the story. You know, uh, the characters are a little bit more cold, a little bit more alien, which might put some people off. But I think that it, it helped with the story and the world building. And I knew that when this movie came out, we were going to see a bit more character so that's what I was looking forward to going into this. Dune has often been considered unfilmable uh, just because of how dense, complicated it is, and, and also because the style of the book feels a lot more just dry and it's a, it's a lot more internal monologue. It's not, it's not all about the spectacle. So in order to adapt it for a screen, whether television or otherwise, you'd really, really, really 
have to work around a lot of exposition. And that's that's the most difficult thing to do when it comes to Dune. Of course, visually and narratively, there are a lot of works that have been inspired, uh, but most notably Star Wars. I mean, you got the sand planet, you got the giant worm mouth holes in the ground, you, know, you got the sand people, kind of mystical abilities that make people do things against their will. So you have like the force and then the voice, you know, the young destined hero with the old sage who teaches him the ways, creepy slug man. Denis Villeneuve has gone on record saying that Dune is just Star Wars for adults, and I can't really argue with that. No hate on Star Wars, of course. But with all this buzz and all this buildup, was the wait worth it? And if it was, is this film better than the first? Well, let's get into it. Dune Part 2 picks up moments after the ending of the first film, with our protagonist, Paul Atreides, traversing the desert with his mother and the native Fremen tribe. Now that House Atreides has fallen, the Harkonnen begin to tighten their grip over Dune to regain power over spice mining. But Paul Atreides begins his conquest of revenge as he finds himself in the middle of a Fremen prophecy of the Lisan al Gaib the messiah who will lead the Fremen to paradise. Tensions rise as his companion, Chani, fears that he will be corrupted by a legend she believes to be a myth. A shadowy conspiracy begins to surface as the Harkonnen, the Bene Gesserit, and the Emperor all begin to move their chess pieces on this giant game of interplanetary war. As soon as the opening Sadukar chant blasted on the IMAX speakers, I was locked in. I was ready. I was loaded. I saw this movie opening day at 3 p.m. There was nothing there but adults. No, no annoying kids. No talking. Everyone in there was just locked in like a roller coaster. Denis Villeneuve said that this film technically could be viewed without seeing the first and that it could be independent even though it is a continuation of the first. And while I'm not so sure about that, I will say that the opening sequence does have a really nice montage that helps pick up where we left off, helps remind you of all the different factions and really just kind of sets up, sets up the world and it's done very beautifully. I mean the, the imagery just in the opening credits alone just gave me chills. I was so excited. The first Dune was more of a tragedy. It was about the fall of a kingdom, essentially. And, and this film definitely takes more of a revenge angle, a little bit more of like the Northmen in a way. Um, and they really focus on Paul and make it a Paul-centric story. They make sure to give each character enough screen time and give you their motivations. But the first film, Paul felt more like a passive character. Things were happening to him, but this one, he's a lot more proactive and you're really starting to see all the loose ends from the first film getting tied up here. This is gonna be the most painfully obvious thing anyone could say, but God damn, this movie's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I just wanna go up to the screen and kiss it. We get dozens of sci-fi films every year that are loaded. I mean, just absolutely loaded with CGI and compositing. And this film, definitely has a lot of CGI, a lot of compositing, a lot of visual effects going on. However, by some miracle, just like the first film and just like Blade Runner, Denis Villeneuve and Greg Frazier have such a brilliant way of mixing the practically shot on location scenes shot in the literal dunes of the desert with the computer generated ships and, and, and creatures and it's really just a masterclass of how to use visual effects and computer graphics to enhance a story and to not just rely solely on those computer generated effects. You know it's CGI and you know it's not real, but it's so easy to buy into this world. It feels so real, so tangible, and it's so well thought out. A lot of that is, of course, thanks to Frank Herbert and his writing in the original Dune, but also to Denis's vision and to Greg Fraser's framing and, and the way they set up the shots, it just really makes you feel like you're watching something happen from a distance, like a volcano exploding or a natural disaster. There's just this element of grit and realism and the camera always really feels locked in a realistic way. And they're not afraid to get the screen dirty and to obscure uh, the, the, the spectacle in order to make it look more realistic and really blend in. And one of the ways they do that is they actually, which they did this with Lord of the Rings back in the day, they will shoot it digitally and add the visual effects um, and then they'll run that through film and they'll run it back to digital because what that does is it adds this fine layer of grain over everything and it helps blend the two together so that way when you see the fi final composite on screen it really plays as one solid image as opposed to here's the live action stuff here's the cartoon shit next to them and you know you don't have that distinction it really all flows together organically and 
it's weird you know this movie's budget isn't that much higher than a lot of these other blockbusters that we're seeing it's just the techniques are so much better and just the way they handle it you can really tell so much love went to every little detail you don't have to shoot everything on location but mixing real locations with digital compositing is just so much better than surrounding everybody with blue or green screen. You know, it allows the actors to have something to react to and act against. And it also helps you have a reference for lighting and color in order to blend in those visual effects better. And this of course is only enhanced by the taller IMAX uh, ratio and the beautiful, beautiful sound design. I mean, if this doesn't win uh, Oscar for best sound design, I don't know what will. I still can't get over how cool the Harkonnen flotation devices are. Uh, there's an opening scene where there's an eclipse happening uh, on Arrakis. So it's like this burnt orange everywhere. It's very nightmarish. Uh, it looks like berserk almost, like the eclipse. And then you have these Harkonnen using their flotation devices to go up this rock. and. It's, it doesn't read as silly or goofy as so many sci-fi films do. It just has such a real quality to it. This film has nearly a three hour runtime and I did not feel it one bit. I was engaged the whole way through and even though this film technically ends where the original book did, it has such an exciting climax, I was left wanting even more. And that's saying a lot when a movie gets you in a seat for three hours and you leave saying, wow, I could have done with more. It's better to leave you wanting more than to drag on for too long. This movie has a lot of great set pieces, but I think the one that's gonna stick with people the most is all the stuff on Getty Prime, the planet of the Harkonnens. In the first film, it was the Sadukar planet with the great Sadukar chant, that blood ritual, Mongolian throat singing shit was Man, I think everyone's ears perked up, and I think a lot of us, especially the neurodivergent people, were like... <laughs> it just sounded so great. It was such great world building. It was so creepy, like nothing we'd ever seen before, and was just super exciting, even though the scene itself didn't have any action. And in this movie, we have the introduction of Fade Rotha, the new antagonist from Getty Prime, the Harkonnen planet. So it's one of the Baron's nephews, played by Austin Butler. His introduction scene... This is so cool. It is so awesome. It is just perfect, beautiful sci-fi world building. You have this big arena, this Colosseum. It's like some, you know, it's like some Roman battle shit uh, with these super creepy dudes and these weird, weird costumes that are, you know, circling around him. You have this really eerie kind of like black and white look to it, which apparently was done using infrared cameras, meaning they had one shot. They had to commit to that look. So you have him showing how psychotic he is and you have all this, you know, cheering and roaring that just the sound design and the cool, you know, fireworks in the air going off. It just really felt like you were in another world. It was so alien and so unlike anything I'd seen before in a movie. And I think it's gonna stick with people the same way that the Sadakar scene did in the first movie. It was very reminiscent of like an H.R. Geiger painting. It was very nightmarish and weird and just really set a tone for this villain. And speaking of the antagonist, I think if I had to have any complaint about this movie, that's probably what it would be, and it would be very minor, and that with this world being so fleshed out and having so much character, the Harkonnens never really get a super in-depth look. I mean, you totally get what they're about, you get their motivation, so you, you know, they serve their purpose in the story just fine. But they're pretty one-dimensional. They're mostly just snarling, vicious bad guys. And for this entire planet and society to kind of just be like, ooh, scary bad guy, it just kind of plays as one-dimensional when you compare them to some of the other characters and some of the other worlds. And for, again, a world that's so fleshed out, so well thought out, I feel like the Harkonnens, pretty much whenever they're on screen, are just there to be creepy or start screaming, which again, it works, but it's just a very minor, minor note. But again, they're so visually striking and the performances are so good that I really don't think it's a big deal. And one complaint a lot of people had about the first movie that I mentioned earlier is that, you know, the movie was kind of slow and that wasn't really helped by the fact that a lot of the characters were so serious and stoic and cold. The only character really that kind of helped give the movie any charm was Jason Momoa. But with his character being gone now, uh, it kind of left this open hole for someone else to come in and fill that role to just give a little bit more levity and really just more humanity to kind of help 
make the characters feel just a little bit more real and not just like talking heads. So with Duncan Idaho gone, who is the character who filled in a role of being more of a mentor and giving the film a little bit more life? Well, Javier Bardem playing Stilgar in this film I personally thought was brilliant. I know that his character is a little different from the books in his cadence and behavior, but his love of Paul works so well. You really believe every word he says and you believe his conviction. And the humor, to me at least, felt natural and 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 and, and seemed kind of I don't know, endearing. It didn't feel too goofy or cheesy. There wasn't too many one-liners that I rolled my eyes at or anything like that. The relationship between him and Paul, I think, was done wonderfully. And I think that, considering where the st story is going, might make his character seem a little bit more tragic. Um, of course, I don't want to go into the lore for people who don't know and don't want to be uh, ruined for the next film. But, you know, the story goes in places you might not expect. And I think Stilgar, this, I think this version of Stilgar will play into that very well. You can tell Javier Bardem was really into this role and you know it was hot as hell in that desert so the fact he was able to pull out this performance and bring so much life to this movie I think is great. And speaking of character and being natural, Denis Villeneuve has gone on record saying that he's not a big fan of dialogue and that's actually his least favorite part of the filmmaking process going as far to say that, that it was influence coming from television and theater that made films more dialogue heavy. Uh, and while I get what he's where he's going at with that even silent films had dialogue it was just text on a screen and there's way too many movies with memorable lines for me to completely write off dialogue like that but it's very obvious that denis is more of a visual director and i think that you know this movie plays so well visually the storytelling is done so much through what's on the screen not what's said and it's more about feeling it than it is you know understanding every single word I, I totally get where he's coming from, and I think that both movies, you know, even though they're not the most character rich, are so rich in story and so visually beautiful and stunning that it informs the character and, and, and you really feel it. Not every movie has to be made the same. Not every movie needs the same three act structure. You don't have to have the best characters, the best this, the best that. It's about using the tools that you have to tell the story on film. And this movie, and both movies, I think, are engaging the whole way through. I, I was never bored. I know some, you know, it's not for everyone. And I think that should be said. You know, it's okay to not like these movies. If you don't like this kind of storytelling, uh, I totally get it. But for me, you know, being that I'm a big science fiction guy and, you know, I like spectacle with the more subtle you know, character notes, um, you know, things like Blade Runner hell even things like you know annihilation or, or or arrival where it really is you know high concept genre movie filmmaking um this both of these i thought were, were brilliant so I, I had no issues with the way characters were portrayed all right let's talk about hollywood's new lover boy timothy chalamet As I mentioned earlier, in the first film, Paul was more of a passive character. The story was happening to him. He didn't really have any active involvement. So because of that, I feel like uh, Chalamet didn't really get a whole lot to work with. I mean, with what he was given, he did great. But as a main character, I found him slightly less interesting than some a lot of the people around him. Um, and you know, it's definitely not you know the fault of the actor. And it's not even necessarily an, an inherent flaw with the script so much as it is just not what we're really used to when it comes to these kinds of stories. But in this film, they really shift that focus onto him and they really give him a chance to shine and show a lot more range. Uh, you know, the, the, where this character starts off versus where he ends is a dramatic shift. And you really feel that by the end of the movie. And I feel like uh, Chalamet really got a chance to show what he can do in this kind of movie because he's been brilliant. He's been great in a lot of things. You know, you had Call Me By Your Name. You had that one cannibal movie. I can't remember the name of it. I'll put it on screen, but that, that, that's another one that he was in. And of course, you had Little Women as well. So, you know, he, he he's had range, but again, in this big blockbuster type of role, it's a totally different kind of performance. And 
you just really get to see him come into his own in this movie. So I think he, he did a lot better and was given better material. And if you watch the movies back to back, I think it really has this perfect arc where he ends up. It's always awesome when you get to have an actor, you know, play a transformation in a character like that. Um, and, it, you know, it's a shame you, you can't have a six hour long movie, you know, so for them to break up that that arc between two films, it, it kind of lets me forgive the, the, you know, lack of character in that first movie and, and, and kind of see it as one big picture. And just a very quick side note here, there's a lot of articles and a lot of videos and just a lot of buzz that came out uh, whenever the first part and also this part came out with people complaining in regards to the pushing of the white savior narrative. Now, if you're not familiar with that, it's pretty self-explanatory. It sees grandiose stories about this, you know, white figure, usually a male, that comes in to this indigenous tribe or whatever and saves the day. And like, it's it's... This, this guy who comes in, even if there's, if there's like evil, you know, racist white people, there's this, you know, very angelic-like white figure who comes in, saves everybody and becomes a hero and gains the respect of these people. It's a very uh, old fashioned trope that you see in a lot of stories. And a lot of people were pointing their fingers at this movie, claiming that it's perpetuating the white savior narrative. And you know, that's where I got to step in and everyone else who knows the story has to step in and say, Paul Atreides, isn't really a good guy, nor is he really a savior. It might look like that on the surface, but the whole point of Frank Herbert's story is to be very careful around charismatic figures and beware anyone who saves a nation or, or is labeled as a hero. It's a critique on the military industrial complex and capitalism. It's a critique on messiahs and religious a zealots and and falling victim to spiritual manipulation in regards to cults etc and really just about the dangers of a hero figure now i think they make it pretty damn obvious by the end of this movie that you know where the future of this story is going probably isn't going to be very bright and by probably i mean most definitely i'm just trying to avoid specific spoilers but paul atreides is a very flawed figure and you're not supposed to idolize him. Again, this wouldn't be the first time that people aren't media literate and just jump to, you know, surface value conclusions, but hey, what are you gonna do? Playing opposite to him, of course, is another Hollywood sweetheart, Zendaya, playing Chani. And while I did like Chani in the first film, I like her even more here. And this is, I think, going to be something that's gonna split a lot of people on this movie who have read the books or who know the source material. If you don't know the source material, I don't think this will mean shit. But her character has a lot more agency and, and plays a much more complex and multifaceted role than she does in the books. And I think that having her kind of represent the moral dilemma of Paul Atreides' journey and, and, and showing the complexity of his decisions and having this, you know, a loving but somewhat opposing view to him is genius in my opinion. I think it really helps incorporate Frank Herbert's message of the original book into the story in a natural way. Even though she has a very tough exterior, you can tell she really loves Paul um, and, and she cares for him deeply and you see that sensitive side to her, but then you also see you know, that the Fremen culture is divided about whether or not, you know, the chosen one, the prophecy is even real, uh, which of course, a, a, as we know, is a Bene Gesserit, you know, propaganda, basically. It's this this, this uh, uh, way to, to harness the power of these people for themselves. And so to see that back and forth dilemma and her, you know, loving him and supporting him, but, you know, being very afraid of what he might turn into added drama and stakes on a personal level that I think really enhanced the story. Another performance in this that I think is slightly underrated is Rebecca Ferguson playing Paul's mother. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who doesn't know the story, but she also experiences a transformation. Um, and I'm not sure how different it is from the book, but in this, in this movie, I mean, she's, she's scary as hell. Like she's like, really scary in my opinion and she, she, she's she's really bringing this this kind of ominous very dark and imposing uh essence to lady jessica that i thought worked really well and made her really interesting to watch there's these beautiful shots that resemble uh 2001 a space odyssey of a fetus uh, but it's floating uh, inside of her and you see these close-ups and it's so eerie but still beautiful and 
I, I just loved those shots because, you know, when it filled up that big IMAX screen, you really felt this intimate connection between her and her daughter. And of course, the performance that everyone keeps going on and on about is Austin Butler as Fade Rotha. Again, I think he did great. His introduction was brilliant. Uh, he, he actually, his voice actually mimics how the Baron speaks. And it's something I didn't notice at first, but going back and listening to it again, it really helps draw this connection between him and his family. And, and just makes him so much more creepy and weird, like a little lizard person. You know, a lot of the Harkonnens kind of look like BDSM meets powder. It's they're very creepy, weird, little slimy lizard people. <laughs> and yes, the character is pretty one dimensional. He's just Mr. Fucking Crazy Guy. But I think the performance was so strong that, you know, every time he was on, I got excited to hear what he was gonna say, see what he was gonna do. And I just thought he was a badass, scary, awesome, a great antagonist. And that ending battle between him and Paul, I think, was wonderfully done. So again, you can be kind of one-dimensional if you just do it really well. And then Florence Pugh makes her character debut in the... <laughs> wow, that rhymed. <laughs> Whoops, I did not mean to do that. But yeah, Florence Pugh makes her, her, her first character appearance in this film. She is the daughter of the Emperor, and I think for what she's given, she does a fine job. You can tell that she loves her father, but her allegiance is to the Bene Gesserit, and you know it, it was it was not a whole lot for her to do i mean her character is important but for you know what she was there for i think she did a great job her costumes were some of my favorite i really liked uh the real look that she had oh boy oh god now we got to talk about the emperor oh man <laughs> all right so christopher walken christopher walken is goofy as hell in this every time he was on screen it's like he didn't know where he was. It's like he, he waddled in like a turtle, like, and it was, it was unintentionally funny. I, I don't know if it's, if it was, you know, miscast or what, but every time Christopher Walken was on screen, I just started giggling to myself and I heard other people laughing too. And, you know, I, I, whenever they announced that he was being cast, I was like, man, I wonder what, you know, what he's going to do with the voice. He doesn't do shit with the voice. It's a Christopher Walken voice. It is so weird. And you know, fortunately, he isn't really given a whole lot of lines. And he speaks pretty slowly and softly. But even then, you just hear that, that Walken come out, come out of him. And it was just a weird casting choice. By the end of the movie, I, I, I got used to it. But man, it just... What a decision to have Christopher Walken in this movie. He's a great... He's a legend. But I just don't know how I felt, you know, again, fortunately, he doesn't speak that much. <laughs> and when he does, you know, it, it's okay. But he was the only actor in the movie where I was like, mm, I really don't know how to feel about this. I think I think I'll, I'll come to love it, but maybe not for the right reasons. <laughs> so while Doom Part 2 did complete the story of the first book, it is so exciting, so exhilarating, and, and, and takes such a twist at the end, you can't help but immediately ask for a third. And thankfully, Denis Villeneuve has already said that he's currently writing Dune Messiah, so hopefully we don't have to wait too long. There's a final shot with Zendaya at the end of this movie that made everyone in the theater gasp. We were like, oh shit, no you did not just do that. And it, it, you know, it's a change from the book, but I think it works for the best. And while I do think these two movies work as a single package on their own, technically could leave it here a lot of those themes you know ab about corruption about power about you know the false messiah and, and the dangers of charismatic leaders and and, and religious zealots um i think a third film would really help end this saga so uh, you know i hope 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 that it comes out soon but even if it doesn't just these two movies on their own are a masterpiece they are brilliant and really don't see movies like this often it's only maybe once in a decade you really see spectacle quite like this and again this story isn't for everyone if you don't really like science fiction i don't think this movie is going to do much for you it's very pretty to look at but you might find yourself bored if you just can't keep up with all of the you know factions and all the different terminology and i know for a fact there's going to be a lot of haters who are readers of the book and really just didn't want anything changed at all but it's so obvious that Denis Villeneuve is so passionate about this material and that he loves that book. He referred to it as his Bible. And so I think the changes that were made 
especially with the fact that there's no time skip or anything like that in this movie, makes sense for the momentum that he was going for. If you had a four year time skip like they did in the book, I think that would really would have muddied the pacing and just added a lot of baggage that this movie didn't need. So I get why a lot of people who read the original book aren't happy with this adaptation. But you always have the miniseries, you always have that original film, you always have this book. I think that these films do an amazing job at, you know, trying to get that source material into an exciting cinematic experience. And again, even if you haven't read these books or don't know the lore, these movies are just so exciting, so big, so beautiful, and, and, and just full of so much passion, so much artistic integrity. To me, it's kind of unfair to just write them off because they're not exactly like the books. And even though it's not for everyone, I do think everyone should at least give it a chance. And if you're gonna see it, you gotta go big, you gotta go loud. This was my favorite IMAX experience I've ever had. Uh, you know, it was better than Avatar, better than so many other movies I've seen in IMAX. So if you're going to see it, I think it's worth paying extra to, to see an IMAX. And if you get a chance, get this goofy ass, warm mussy uh, popcorn bucket. It doesn't really work really well because your hand gets stuck in it but you know what this shit is gonna go for like a billion dollars in the future so get yourself a dune popcorn bucket if they still have them and so with all that out of the way i think i give dune part one a eight and a half out of 10. I'm going to give Dune Part 2 a 9.5 out of 10. The only thing that's keeping me from giving it a perfect 10 is that, you know, it doesn't stand alone completely on its own. It does kind of leave it somewhat cliffhangery, just a little bit. And I'm not sure if Dune Part 1 and 2 will be an all time favorite the way that Arrival was. Uh, but it, it, I mean, they're still, they're really high up there. I mean, I, I'm definitely going to rewatch these movies again and again and again on my TV with the surround sound on, uh, you know, I, and I just cannot wait for a third part. And everyone who's saying that this is the next Lord of the Rings or it's as great as Lord of the Rings or the best film since Lord of the Rings, these are both really damn good. And I love the shit out of them, but, but you got to be kidding. These aren't nearly as good as the Lord of the Rings. I mean, Lord of the Rings makes me cry every single time. There's just so much raw emotion and sentimentality. And maybe it's just an apples to oranges comparison. It's not fair, but I do not think these are as good or as revolutionary as Lord of the Rings. They are really high up there, but come on for Frodo. Not to mention, I was really looking forward to some gross, freaky deaky looking mutant space navigators. And I really thought Denis Villeneuve would come up with a really creative way to show them. After all, he had the aliens from Arrival, which also were in a giant gaseous tank. So hopefully we'll see those in the next movie. And I just wanna say thank you to all the new subscribers. I recently got around 300 new subscribers within like less than a month span of time. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for subscribing. Uh, I hope that you enjoy the content I'm making. And I'm sorry that took me so long to put this out. I was in Japan for two weeks, so maybe I'll make a little vlog or video about that. But until next time, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you at the next review. Yeah, yeah. Live from G25, let's go. Statistic, yep. Statistic, yep. Yep. Statistic, yep. Yep. Statistic, yep. Yep. Statistic, yep. 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 Yep.